Hi there guys, welcome back to day three. I'm Alex and we've got Alex and Todd up here in the tower. How are you guys going today? What a great day. Good to see you uh, all online. This is our third day up here in the uh, the windswept cometry box. The eagle's nest. <laughs> got the rain about to come in again and I tell you uh, what a difference a, uh, a bucket of rain makes to the track. Uh, you can see it there in the footage. You can see how much we've torn it up this morning and it's going to get a bit worse I think. Mind you, Alex, the uh, the tanks are absolutely loving it. The oh, they are. I mean, you look at the particular. leopard sprinting around there. We had a little problem with the fuel lines this morning, but she's just going to go strong all day. And that leopard one, she's making some huge furrows when, as she goes into the turns there. Mm. It's uh, making it a little bit difficult for some of the wheeled vehicles to follow in the footpath. Yeah. But L uh, Good old Belgian leopard ones. Oh, yes. Well, here comes the rain again. And we are exposed up here, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make the best of it, Alex. We've got tarps and uh, <laughs> we're not too wet, so sh sh we should but be okay. So this is day three of uh, Oz Armoured Fest, everybody. So there's and Teddy uh, going around the track. So Teddy's a Vietnam vet. Teddy's actually probably the one of the more travelled vehicles in the museum, I think, because you've got your M113 came to Australia from America. Your salad and tarots come from the UK. They've been mated here. It's gone to Vietnam. It's come back. And then it's gone over to the United States and then back here again. So it's probably yes. one of the more travelled vehicles, that one. And I'm glad we've got it in the collection. I mean, it's an iconic, now an, an iconic Australian armoured vehicle used Absolutely. in the Vietnam War. Absolutely. Modification using the M113 American hull and uh, putting on a Saladin mm. um, turret. Interesting thing with, um, with Teddy is Teddy actually, when Rob went over to Littlefields, because it was part of the Littlefield collection yep. to purchase that one, um, it still had the breach in it. It was still live. <laughs> so uh, very interesting, that one, that uh, the Australian Army let go of it as a uh, still live vehicle. And you wonder how it got past uh, US Customs. Yes. Yes, it's a bit interesting, <laughs> that one. They so. probably thought it was a returning vehicle. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so just back to yesterday, guys. I did say I was going to go check, but the vehicle I was referring to yesterday that uses the Walker Bulldog chassis was the, uh, the M52 SPH self-propelled howitzer. That was the one I was referring to yesterday for clarification. So, now guys, as with yesterday, feel free to send through your questions. Um, we're going to run the camera around the track for a bit more, and then we might duck the camera inside and have a look at some of the exhibits, and you guys can let us know what you want to see next year. If you're coming for next year, what you'd like to ride, and uh, any questions you have about the museum collection. And let us know what you'd like to so see from inside the museum. I must say, uh, the Panthers uh, parked in there today out of the weather. The Jag Panther. Uh, and a, a number of other very special vehicles. The two um, Mark III, the Stug and the, um, and the Panzer. Some uh, new acquisitions. What a wonderful collection. So we've got the T-72 back out again today. Uh, we couldn't get the 55 out because it wouldn't go into reverse gear. We had to hit it with the sledgehammer. So 72 makes another appearance today. It's just such a reliable vehicle. That'll be running all day, Alex. I reckon yeah. oh, uh, it'll be non-stop till 4 o'clock. All oh, the Tier 1s will be non-stop. Yeah, you go. you've got some happy riders there. Ah, yes. Added to their bucket list. Look at the, the smiles. <laughs> and I must say, I think we're keeping the public out of the mud. No, mm. It's just people like you and me who are tromping through it. And the drivers, of course. Not as many people coming in today. I think uh, yesterday would have been the, the, the Yesterday the was a day. bit busier, but um, we've still got quite a few here today. We had crowds out the door um, yeah. lining lining up for their uh, for their ride tickets. Mm. Today, I think we had a lot of overnight rain, and um, you know, people are a little bit later coming into the museum. Yeah, guys, we can see your comments just about the audio breaking up, um, just in case this is going through. Just give the, uh, give the video a bit of a refresh. Hopefully that'll fix the problem. Otherwise, I'm sure the tech guys are onto it already. On screen now is the uh, Spartan armoured reconnaissance vehicle painted in its Middle East colours, used extensively by the uh, British uh, in the Middle East, recent Middle East conflicts. That vehicle actually was a local acquisition. Um, the fellow who owned it only lived about an hour down the road. He called Rob up one weekend and said, Hi, I can't afford to keep it and the brakes are broken on it. Do you want to buy it off me? So we went up with the truck and we picked it up on that on that weekend and brought it home. Never ceases to amaze me what people have got stored in their sheds. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> 
Leopards are probably a little bit too big for people. But these smaller vehicles, yes, absolutely. A shot now of uh, the lo loading bay. Yes, you can feel the ground rumble as we uh, as we sit up here in the commentary box as these vehicles thunder past us. Passengers receiving their uh, safety brief from Bo. That's not Bo. That's that's, um, that's one of our young volunteers. Ah, though. right. Now we do apologise about the audio, guys. I'm sure they're onto it now, and uh, hopefully they'll get that fixed sorted shortly. Good shot of the uh, Walker Bulldog coming Audio's past. Audio's fixed. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Well, sorry about that. If you guys have any questions, feel free to send them through and uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can. Uh, we do apologise for that audio issue as well. There you go. you got the OT810 there, Hitler's Revenge. And then you got Jason out there in his leopard. He's, he's like a duck in mud at the moment. He's just going to go all day with that leopard. You can't get him out once he gets in. That's right. He only glues himself to the only seat. stop is for fuel. Exactly. And I must say, year after year, the Leopard is one of the uh, the favourite ride vehicles. Oh, Leopard and T72. They and just the go T72. Everyone wants to ride in those big, heavy vehicles. And they're just so iconic, those, those Cold War period vehicles. They're just... And they're big and impressive and noisy and loud. You know, they're, they're the, the monsters of the, of the track today, and that's why everyone's after them. Yes, you've got the uh, OT80 uh, ahead of it, struggling through the mud. So, Miles Newman, uh, you're mentioning the AS1. So, the AS1 does run, but it isn't actually owned by the museum. It's owned by the Australian government. So, we, we don't really run it. Um, we do have permission to move it small distances, but we don't have permission to run it out on the track. The little Cooper wagon. They can go anywhere. Oh, yeah. Two-wheel drive, driving, light as a feather. With Mick driving, it'll go anywhere. <laughs> Trying to stay out of the uh, the He's doing his best. Ruts. So as you can see there, guys, we've got the Stug 4 in shot. Unfortunately, uh, the steering's gone on that one, so we can't run that one today. There's Manfred in the Schwimmwagen. Schwimmwagen has definitely been one of the more popular vehicles. I think it did 20 rides yesterday. So, and I think that'll be a fifth or sixth today. Yes, I think people are coming to the museum and are absolutely shocked at all the, uh, the new exhibits here and, uh, and the uh, rides which are available. And uh, some of these people have uh, only ever dreamed of getting a ride in oh, some of these absolutely. iconic vehicles. No, and as we said yesterday, the only place where you can really do this is here. You know, you can go to Bovington and jump in the raffle and maybe get extremely lucky, or you can go to Miller Tracks and hope that the vehicles are running or the vehicles you want are there. You know, here we've got a schedule, we've got a program, and you can just jump in a vehicle like these people. Yep, and you're in real field conditions today with all <laughs> through all that mud. <laughs> I feel sorry for everyone, including ourselves, who have to uh, clean these vehicles up before we put them away this afternoon. Exactly. So I think the camera guys are heading inside, but if they are, can you make your way over to uh, Hargo? So JWWT4 has asked about our Japanese vehicles in the collection. So we'll try to get the camera out onto those and show you off that vehicle there. Uh, Kestrel, we won't have the 38T out today. Um, it was out on Friday for exhibition, but it's, it's just a little bit too small, a little bit underpowered to get out as a ride vehicle, and it overheats quite quickly. So Horsby's asking about the Walker. So the Walker Bulldog is an ex-Kiwi one. So it's one of the 10 that New Zealand received from the United States. Um, it's actually parts from two vehicles. So the turret's off one that was damaged in a crash, I think, I believe. And the hull is one that was a recovery vehicle. Came to New Zealand without a turret. They were put together in Geelong by an engineering team and uh, brought back to condition. I reckon the condition's better than when it left the American factories. It runs so well. 
Well, so the interesting fact about the Walker Bulldogs, uh, which were given to the New Zealanders, the Americans gave them 10 on the condition they, uh, they train on them and take them to um, South Vietnam. Um, the yeah. Kiwis accepted the 10 vehicles and never deployed them. Exactly. Oh, so there's our Hargo. So our cute little Japanese Hargo there. She's an absolutely beautiful vehicle. As you can see, you know, she's been out in the weather for a very long time. But she's an incredibly lucky vehicle. So what happened was when the Japanese surrendered at Rabaul uh, in 1945, the Australian Army picked up all the vehicles and shipped them back to Australia. So there were about 36, I believe. Um, of them, the, the Army completely destroyed two, I think, and the third one, they ran over a landmine. Um, that one ended up in a private collection and is now at the War Memorial. The rest of the vehicles were disposed of, and actually most of them got scrapped. Um, this one was destined for the scrapyard, and a gentleman by the name of Monty Welds actually found this vehicle in a scrapyard and saved it and kept it in his backyard in rural New South Wales for about for about 50 years. So oh, yes. He, uh, he then went on to build a, uh, a small military museum yes. up at, uh, outside the RAF base at Williamstown. And yes. I remember oh, seeing no, this tank. In, in Victoria? No, no, uh, Williamstown up, up in New South Wales. Oh, and, yep. uh, I remember seeing this tank about 20 years ago. It was always kept under a blue tarp, but outside <laughs> in the weather near the, near the coast. So you can so see in there, guys, you've got the, the air-cooled diesel engine. So we actually hope to get this vehicle out and into the workshops one day soon, and it'll go a full internal and external restoration. So this will be a running vehicle one day, which will be really, really awesome. Well, just like the, uh, the War Museum. They've got theirs running, and uh, they bring it out on occasion. The, which war museum? The one in the UK? This is, uh, no, the Australian War Memorial. Oh, the War Memorial's yes. one doesn't run, though. That one doesn't. The yes, yeah, doesn't no, it? they've got it fully operational now. Oh, excellent. And I've seen it uh, on display on uh, some of their big um, open days. Oh, excellent. So now we're back on the track there with the Walker. That's just such a great vehicle, that one. Well, it's, it's uh, had three days of hard running and uh, still lapping it up. No mechanical issues whatsoever. It's employed extensively in Vietnam. Uh, the Americans uh, issued the, the uh, Walker Bulldog to the South Vietnamese Army and uh, they employed it extensively. So we're seeing a couple of requests for one-off vehicles and stuff like that. Uh, we might take the camera over to the 11 one half track and we'll give you a good look at that because that's a very interesting vehicle in the German section. So tank graveyard in Victoria. Uh, there's, there's actually quite a few tank graveyards around the country. Um, because after the war, Australia had about, if correct me if I'm wrong, it was over 2,000 armoured vehicles on books. Yes. Um, so we had about 400 Matildas. I think it was that again, Lees and Grants. Um, we had Churchill. We had Bren carriers. We had all the Australian domestically produced vehicles too, like the cruisers. Um, so the army didn't want all these vehicles. So they all got disposed of. Um, so they went for sale at auction. There's actually stories of people getting in them and driving from Williamstown Wharf in Melbourne and driving up the Hume Highway into <laughs> Victoria in the middle of the night in convoys. Well, that's right. And a lot of, the, a lot of them went to farmers and exactly. they're modified as, as farm vehicles. So you see them in these big collections and what you see is a tank graveyard is actually a farmer's bought a few of them. And farmers never throw anything away because there's always a use for something. Even if it doesn't work and it's just rusting in the paddock, they'll get to it one day or they'll fix it up one day. And that's, that's very good mentality for conservation because there's always those exhibits floating around. Here are some interesting facts for you. In uh, 1943, this is the, the number of tanks we had. Matilda 2s, we had 304. M3 Stewarts, 260. M3 Grants, 757. Is that Joss Grants or is that Lees and Grants together? That's Lees have? and Grants. Yeah. And uh, the Marmon uh, Harrington, uh, little two-man tanks, we had 138 of those. So as you can see now on the guys, we've got the, the 251 half tracks. That's one of our beautiful 251s next to the Panther there. So the camera will probably cut around to the left there and take us over to the flak half track. That's a very interesting one too. And then you can see there the, uh, the other 251 with the Pack 40 on the back. That's a bit of an interesting one. Here How we are. beautiful is that Panther and that Yag Panther And everyone's there. been coming to the museum to have a look at this. Absolutely. This Panther tank. Go around the back of the Jag Panther. So there's the Jag, there's the uh, SDKFZ 11-1. So it's a flak half track. Um, and a lot of people do mistake it for a 251. But as you go around to the front of the vehicle, you'll see it's got a completely different armoured cabin shape, doesn't it? You know, Absolutely. It's, it just looks so different. And it's a really unique vehicle because this is the only one in the world. And this one is uh, in perfectly restored. Oh, perfectly restored, original engine. 
Um, it's just incredible. This one was done by uh, Bruce Crompton of the Combat Dealers fame and his team of the twins and his other staff and crew. And it's just a really beautiful vehicle. And we had this one running around the track on, uh, on, on Friday. Friday yeah. And, uh, wow, very impressive sight. I think it was following the Panther. But uh, holy smoke, you know. You can see that extra, that extra angle there on the front, and you can see the cab's actually quite different. Um, if you're looking at it from a distance to the side, it can sort of feels like it's the same, but when you're looking at it like that, you can see it's a completely different shape, that armoured cab, even though the very front is very similar. So that's, that's probably the rarest vehicle we have in the museum because it is the only one. So, yep. I mean, out of 600, there's only one left. So there you go, there's the Humvee out on the track. It's a pretty, pretty generic modern vehicle, but it's so popular with the people here today. You know, it's just so iconic. And you see it in so many modern films and things like that. It's just... Well, I suppose it's taken the, it's taken the place of the... Uh Ambiguous Jeep, mm. Willys, Willys and Ford Jeep. Now the U US Army is sort of symbolised by the, the Hummer and it's been used in all theatres. This is an unarmoured Hummer. The, uh, the ar armoured Hummers which they were using in Iraq and Afghanistan had uh, ballistic glass yeah. and uh, very big, bulky and uncomfortable to drive in. Uh, but it's making uh, short work of all the mud. Those wide tyres, wide chassis. Not actually well designed to use Australian uh, roads and tracks. It's too big and too wide. I know we considered it for the, uh, for the Land Rover replacement at one stage, but uh, yes, it wouldn't fit on our outback tracks. Yeah, sorry about the audio again, guys. I'm I know the IT guys are on it, but it's probably to do with this bad weather that we're having today. Oh, look, the, uh, the Leopard one's slowing down to an absolute purr. You can almost not hear it. Giving way to the Humvee. And little Teddy, she comes round again. Uh, now we've, we've got the interior shot here. Wow, it's just a, it's just such a beautiful vehicle, the Panther. Is this, this is the Panther? Yeah. Yep. Well, I hope, uh, hope Jason's there in his, uh, in his socks. Because this is a no-boot... Uh, no, it's a no-shoe no, vehicle. No we, shoe have, vehicle. <laughs> we have two no-shoe vehicles here at the museum. One's the Panther and one's the Hargo... Uh, not the Hargo, sorry, the Hetzer. Hetzer, yes. What a beautiful restoration job has been done on the, uh, on the Panther. So back on the track, you can see the little bobcat out there. One of the most important vehicles of the day. It's been running around all day, trying to patch up the track as the tank, just as fast as the tanks destroy it, just to keep things from getting any worse. Yep, as those tanks, uh, those 60 ton tanks go into the corner, they, uh, they're just creating big holes, making it difficult for the other follow on tanks and armored cars. See the little Zundap motorcycle back there to the right? Again, one of the more popular vehicles. Yeah, it's bouncing, it's handling the conditions pretty well. Yeah. Would have been fairly much what they would have experienced on the, uh, the Eastern Front, I'm sure. Mm. We've got the, uh, the Fox Armoured Car doing a run this morning. Well, there's Anarchy back out on the track again. Such a lovely vehicle. A couple of people really enjoying their ride in the uh, M41 Walker Bulldog. Mm. So interestingly with the New Zealand Walkers, they're all named A. 
Yeah. So all their names begin with the letter A. So Anarchy is that one, uh, but Anarchy actually doesn't belong to the hull. It belongs to the turret because the hull never was assigned a name. So there you can see our Tiger, Tiger 114. So interesting thing with our Tiger, because we had to utilize pieces that were found wreckage pieces from all across the eastern and western fronts, um, we have actually utilized some early pieces with the late and the mid-war production pieces. So the only pieces that we can actually identify from the Fugstall numbers are actually early war pieces, which is why we've got, as you would have seen in the, in the Tiger restoration series, we talk about the vehicle, um, the vehicle having history with the front in northern Russia, in Latvia and Estonia. And you can see there's some of the remarkable damage on the sides oh, of the yes, vehicle. Oh, yes, yeah, down, down on the, the back Especially towards the back where yes. I think, I believe myself personally, that someone's depressed an anti-aircraft gun that's firing light ca uh, cannon ammunition or someone's just had fun trying to penetrate it with anti-tank rifles over and over again as a hard target on a range. Or just... The, the problem is with these vehicles is you'll never know. This is a remarkable, a remarkable restoration. Absolutely. And, and you can see the thickness there. We had these spare pieces and we've left them intact so you can see the thickness of the armour plate even on the rear facing is just incredible. It's, a, it's 100 millimetres of armoured uh, plate on the front and uh, boy very difficult to penetrate in fact um, you know unless it was going up against a 17 pounder I mean uh, the normal allies armed with their 75 uh, millimetre guns had no chance of uh, penetrating on the frontal armour. So guys we do apologise again for the audio if you can hear us I know the tech guys are struggling through the problem and I know that they'll get it done as soon as they can. Alex I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, vehicle running Rob tells me um, at some stage the museum's going to at um, some get stage, it running. Um, it's just a question of finding the appropriate engine the appropriate drive components um, we have to remove the Tiger from the museum, take it to the workshops. That in itself is a massive job. I know it was a whole day affair last time, so it's just a question of when we can get to it. And we have so many exciting projects. We announced the KV-1 officially yesterday. We've got the Hargo sometime in the future. We've still got the Stug going on, the Welded Grant, a uh, collection of World War One German field guns. It's just all go here constantly. It's remarkable, and uh, since we were last here a couple of years ago, uh, the uh, the size of the shed has doubled, uh, and it has been filled up. I mean, uh, when we arrived here on Thursday and, and took in all the new vehicles, I think uh, most of us were uh, collectively blown away. With the Panzer IV going round now. A lot slower and steadier than the uh, than the more current versions. So guys, if you can hear us, uh, you've got Teddy there again. If you do have any questions, feel free to put them through. I know it might be difficult to hear us, uh, but just please feel free. Tiny Teddy trying to control her speed as she comes up against the OT-80. Mm. 
And Ken da down there doing some remarkable work uh, keeping the track repaired. <laughs> trying to keep it flat. <laughs> he's and trying to level out some of the big ditches. It's almost a hopeless job, but he's, uh, he's persistent. Backing out of the way now. <laughs> oh, quick, uh, quick snap there of the commentary box as the uh, tiny teddy flew past. So the vehicle that you saw around the track isn't an o it isn't a two five one it is an OT eight ten. So it's, it was actually nicknamed by the Czechs uh, Hitler's Revenge. It's actually kept on in long term storage until the eighties, I believe. So there it goes around the track again. Everyone loves that vehicle. Very happy uh, passengers. It's so similar to the original 251s, yep. but it's so much easier for us to run one of those rather than an actual 251. Also means we can offer it at a much cheaper price for people's rides, and people still love it. It's just such a fun uh, it's, personal uh, it's carrier. It's very popular, and uh, it's a unique vehicle to, uh, to travel around in because you can actually see, uh, see the driver operating the vehicle. It has a steering wheel and a couple of st steering levers, and... Uh, when the, uh, the going gets rough, uh, uh, like it is now in this thick mud, you're uh, pretty well steering it by the steering levers and uh, letting the wheels just spin. Uh, yes, you can hear Panzer lead somewhere in the background there, Leopold. And now you should be able to hear Waltzing Matilda as well. And here's our little Zundap out there. She goes driving. Zundap's such a fun little thing, that bike. And the T72. Yes, we're getting happy waves. Boy, yeah, the old Zundups. I think they're having a very good time here on the Bouncing Zundup. around the track. <laughs> There's Yowie parking up the 113. Oh, I'm on three. Such a unique vehicle, that one. We've got Glenn driving it. Glenn comes out every year. He's a local fellow, and he always drives Teddy. Teddy is his vehicle. It's his spiritual creature, that vehicle. He will drive nothing else. And we've got the team who've uh, come up from Sydney, from the um, Australian Armoured Vehicle Association. They come up every year when they can. Absolutely. It's been difficult for the last couple of years due yes. to COVID. Yes, but, they um, had something called COVID going on. They come up and help out and uh, help with the driving, help with the safety, help with the loading. Um, yes, it's a big team required to, uh, to put on an event like this, particularly Absolutely. running over three days. Very tiring. I remember the early days when uh, we had a small team trying to do everything. Mm. Um, now it's... Uh, it's an amazing transformation. Absolutely. Full-time mechanics keeping the vehicles going and a uh, very professional team who uh, now know what they're doing and make it a very enjoyable uh, occasion for, uh, for members of the public.
Not so busy today. We've had, um, yeah, probably the busiest day yesterday. Um, as I said before, lines of people outside the door uh, queuing to, uh, to get their tickets onto these vehicles. Had quite a lot of rain overnight. It's turned the track very muddy. Um, and we had showers here in Cairns this morning. And uh, it's sort of a very overcast, threatening day. It's probably keeping some of the crowds away. Oh, you away. can hear us? Excellent, guys. But we Sorry. do have the diehards here, and uh, people are thoroughly enjoying themselves in these conditions. Excellent. Well, we've got the sound back on, so people can hear us again. Well, Haven't been able wonderful. to hear us for the last little bit. But we're, we've been talking, guys. We do apologise. We do know that you couldn't hear us very well, but we were still recording good audio um, on the computers. So we've, we kept talking, because then we can post that on, the, on YouTube later on as a completed stream video, which means you'll have all the good audio quality and you can re-watch it and understand what we were saying the whole time. So, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We'll thump through those and answer them as best we can. Uh, we've still got about half an hour of the stream left, so rapid fire the questions at us. And if you want to see something from inside the museum, which is not uh, running around today, just let us know. And uh, Kurt's available and Kurt he'll take Oz us Armour across. Kurt is running around. So again, guys, he loved it yesterday when you said, hi, Kurt. So if you want to tap away in the chat, just say, hi, Kurt from Oz Armour, and he'll appreciate that. And he'll see that as soon as he gets around to looking at all the stream stuff this afternoon. Yes, picture on screen now of the Stug 4, which uh, sadly broke down um, this morning. And we There's a little fox it. running around. I heard a very interesting story about a fox from a Renex British crewman. They were doing manoeuvres in Norway, and they were thumping through a, a paddock at about 80 kilometres an hour. And in front of them, they've got uh, the Sabres. Oh, no, it wasn't Sabres. It might have been Spartans. And they were going along at high speed, and there was a little ditch. So track vehicles go straight over the ditch when they're moving at speed. But when the fox hit the ditch because they didn't know it was there and the commander didn't see it. The commander got thrown 20 metres out of the turret hatch. The driver <laughs> broke all of his teeth. Yep. <laughs> well, uh, they had the, uh, the fox in service when I did a succumbent with the British Army back in the early 90s. Mm. And it was not a well-liked vehicle. No. Uh, it, was, it was prone to roll over. Yes. Uh, because of its Very uh, high heavy. profile. And um, yeah, it was quite a dangerous vehicle. But uh, it replaced the um, Ferret Scout car. Two-man little reconnaissance vehicle. There's a beautiful model here of a Mark II in the, in the museum collection. Absolutely. But they needed a bigger gun and a more powerful vehicle. And uh, the Fox was uh, the successful tenderer. But yes, it, it, uh, it did have its problems. Well, 6AD, your comment about Rip the Stug. Um, well, it happens a bit, I'm afraid. So there, guys, you can see on the stream, so that's the 2S7, uh, the Pion. So the Pions are actually currently in service with the Russian military, and they've actually been using these to shell Odessa from Sevastopol. So they've been shooting across the Black Sea with these, with these vehicles. I think it's the largest gun that's ever been mounted on trucks. It's just It's, it's just a insane. phenomenal vehicle. I believe this one came out of Poland. No, the, oh, it's a Czech-made Czech vehicle, you can see by the Roundel. Yep. But um, I believe this one came from the Littlefield Collection. Right. So this one came out of the Littlefield Collection auction in California. Um, the vehicle actually does run. We've got a little, little bit of work to do on it, but we're hoping to actually get it out and have it as a display in the middle of the track next year for Armourfest. Yeah, well, it would uh, be a fascinating thing to see on the Friday when they, uh, oh. they run some of the more iconic vehicles. Absolutely. The World War II iconic yes. vehicles, yeah. But this thing is just such a monster. It... Uh, Everyone walks into the museum, goes straight to it because you can see it because the gun is so high. <laughs> yeah. It's an icon in the museum and everyone just goes straight to it because they go, what is that? And you can see it's just, it keeps going. Well, well Thor's, Thor's your largest sort of your diameter gun, I believe. But yep. when you look at the, the pure size and the length of this, I believe that this would actually probably be bigger. Yeah. It's just a monster of a thing. And with the, ra the effective range of it, it's just crazy. There's T-72 again. We do always joke when we do the commentary uh, and we, we go down after the day and we have a chat with all the drivers. The drivers all come to us and they go, 
love your commentary and they always say here comes the t72 and here comes the t72 and here comes the t72 because it just keeps going <laughs> all day so when we want to talk about the vehicles we just we have to talk about the t72 because she's just out there all and day and the leopard one <laughs> uh, the two big vehicles here which comes are in the leopard demand. one here comes the t72 <laughs> and it's just all day I'll so this gun here guys it was only just uh you might have seen it on works wednesday actually but this one was only just restored by al so Al's one of our workers in the engineer, engineering team over in the workshops, and Al's been working on German one field guns at the moment. So this is the first gun he's done, which is actually a very rare piece. Um, I believe there's only three or four of these in the whole world. Um, so Al's done the work on this one, and he's still got six more German worst World War guns to yep, go. 1918. Mm, including the Hamel gun. Yes. Very, very incredibly. So that's going to be a really interesting exhibit once we get around to that. A remarkable collection of uh, artillery is on display here in the museum. Again, so some of the iconic uh, iconic guns of uh, the World War One, World War Two, and the later campaigns, and some very rare, uh, as you said, Alex, some yeah, very it's rare guns. Rare. I'll get I'll get Kurt to run us over to the Stuarts if possible, because we do have a, a couple of we have a question, a fellow here that's been asking us some questions about the Stuarts. So we'll, we'll have Kurt run over, and then I'll answer your question there about the Stuarts. So Freya Dakar, we, we don't have Stummtiger. Stummtiger, I wouldn't call that a gun, I'd call that a mortar. It is a, yes. it is a mortar. Yep. It's technically a mortar, isn't it? Yes. So, ha, mortar, not gun. <laughs> so, uh, Jolf Marsberg, we don't have any radio-controlled tanks in the museum. We do have a, an old electric Goliath, but it doesn't operate radio-controlled radio at all. Oh. So we've, uh, we've got the Sabre out on the track now. We just heard it scream underneath us. You would have just seen the, the flags flying past. So we must have had an issue with uh, the Fox most likely and we've got that out as a backup vehicle. Here we are. Here there we go. We so there, the, are, uh, there are a couple M of our Stuarts. So we have M3 Stuart. So you've got the M3 the right. early model there and you can see it's still got the twin side mach Sponson machine guns. Oh, you yep. wouldn't call them a Sponson, would you? Yeah. Because they're not in a Sponson. And then you've got the M5 Stuart there on the left as well. And then we've also got another Stuart, uh, which is an M3A1, because yes, it has so the, the basket. The Stuart on the right, the M3, is what the Australians used uh, against the Japanese at Buna in 1942. Mm. The we interesting thing is with this one, though, is because we welded over yep. the machine gun ports. Yes, we did. So those machine guns, which you can, you're looking at now, the 30 cal machine guns, they were there to fire ahead of the tank to detonate mines. Yeah. So they were originally designed for the for the desert, for the North African ca campaign, but uh, hopelessly inefficient. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you can make jokes about Americans, but when you've got more machine guns than crew members. Yep. <laughs> the other modifications the Australians made as well, as you can see the uh, the open hatches up on the turrets, the, uh, the side flaps, those were knocked off by the Japanese using 20 millimetre mm. anti-aircraft guns. So the Australians welded those uh, those flaps so this, so this vehicle here, we can probably assume, didn't actually go overseas, and this one stayed locally. Yep. Um, on the right-hand side of it, you can actually see the original marking there. We haven't painted over it. And you can still see the original vehicle number mark there. Yes, yeah, so these uh, early model Stuarts, um, they didn't have a tur turret basket. Mm. And the only way in and out for, was through the, uh, the top commander's uh, cupola. Uh, so it made, it made getting out of these vehicles very difficult. So the Americans modified it with the M3A1, which had a two-person turret basket, uh, hydraulically and uh, electrically operated um, turret, and they removed the um, the commander's cupola and they put two hatches in there so yeah. uh, the, uh, the the crew could get out. But what was difficult was that the the driver uh, had a lot of difficulty with the uh, the transmission. No, no, uh, trying to exit the vehicle through yeah. the top two hatches. You yeah. had to get past the turret basket. So the vehicle we can see here, guys, is our M5. So our M5 came, it was restored in Poland, I believe, actually, and it came out to Australia. We've actually had a couple of issues with it so far, but we hope to have this one out on the track running as a, as a ride vehicle maybe next year. It's just a question of how much our, our guys can get done because we've just got so much on our plate. Yep. So if you guys would like to see one of our stewards out on the track next year, uh, just make sure you hit some comments into the into, onto YouTube and we'll we'll do our best. The, the difference between the M5 and your M3s is your M3s run on a radial. 
So they run off a seven-cylinder aircraft engine. That's right. And as opposed to the M5, which runs off your two diesels. Two Cadillacs. Two Cadillac engines. Uh, That's why you see Cadillac the step up at the back. Petrols. 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 Again, the uh, view back towards the the loading ramp and the track. Uh, here we have the M4 Sherman tank, 75 mil gun. Boy, the uh, Americans produced thousands of these. Very efficient uh, vehicle, but unfortunately petrol engines, and uh, they caught fire very easily. Had a hard time against the uh, the German, uh, the Mark IVs, uh, with their longer 75 mil guns and in particular against the Tiger and the Panthers, which could uh, hit them from about uh, 2,000 metres. Mm. So now yep. on the screen, guys, you can see our M4A1 there, Allison. And then you can see behind, actually, as well, our, our M3 Grant there with the radial engine in that as well, Bendigo. If you guys want to see the Grant out maybe next year, that's a running vehicle. Um, if, if it's popular and you guys are interested, maybe yep. we could get that out. So a, if you are interested, it's make sure It's a wonderful sure uh, restoration job exactly. on that Grant. Uh, it runs like a dream boat. It's an early one. It's got the side doors. Um, it's got the big uh, the big turret, which was the Grant. It was the diff primary difference between the, the, the uh, General Lee tank and the one issued to the British. The British wanted to mount a, a radio in the back of the turret, so they had a uh, bigger turret designed. If we have a look over on the right at the, the Lee, you'll see it's a much smaller turret for the 37mm gun. Yes. We actually have the, um, the additional, we recently acquired for the museum collection, the additional turret that fits onto the top. Uh, Commander, the Commander's sort of Capola. Additional which machine gun bit that goes on the top of the Lees. I call it the, I mean, Lee, the top hats. <laughs> it would have been busy in these tanks. They had a crew oh. of seven and they had guns everywhere. I believe that there's a quote for the, for the Grants. It was a British commander in North Africa. And the quote went something along the lines of, please do apologize, I do apologize if I misquoted, but it's something along the lines of, the 75's firing forwards, um, the Browning's jammed, the turrets around backwards, the 37's firing in the wrong direction. I'm there's a, the there's a Mark IV coming over yeah. at Jones and someone's trying to hand me a, a cheese, cheese sandwich, sandwich and a cup <laughs> of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Telling driver to go forwards and he's going backwards and yeah. No, over the top there's seven enemy tanks and someone yeah. hands me cheese sandwich. It might not be an original quote, but yes, no, oh, I know it. Uh, a, I've seen it down uh, in the um, it's a, it's tank a, it's, school at Pucker It's a very interesting quote because even if it isn't accurate, you know, it sort of does give you perspective as to how chaotic some of these vehicles were in combat. Yes, and the Grant, when she came on to the scene uh, in the Western Desert, um, surprised the Germans. Oh, uh, yes. Up until then, really, we had uh, British vehicles which were poorly armed with a two-pounder gun. And they needed to close so much distance that they'd get cut to shreds. That's right. So the British route didn't reveal they had the Grant until uh, the opening stages of the battle and uh, took the German Mark IVs by surprise. Absolutely. You, you hear these horror stories, especially with the Valentine and Matilda crews, because they had, and Crusaders as well, because they had to cross so much open ground a lot of the time to actually be close enough to German vehicles and guns to engage them. Yep. And you hear the, I think, some of the horror stories here with Valentine crews in particular, the amount of crew losses is just, it's horrifying. Oh, absolutely. So um, there, guys, on the screen, you can see our AC4 prototype mock-up, which you'll see, interestingly, is actually an AC1 hull with an AC1 turret with, a, with the 12 pound, the 20, uh, sorry, the 17 pounder fitted because that's what the prototype was. Yep. So the, the, the actual production vehicle was gonna have its different hull. It's similar to the AC3s, but they never actually built the hull for it. And they just made the prototype for testing using an AC1 hull that was existing. The interesting thing about this one though, is the turret for, that's mounted on the cruiser with a 17 actually belongs on the hull of our, of our AC-1 with the two-pounder. <laughs> so at some point, the turrets have got swapped around. If the camera could actually go forward and go up to the, the Bren carrier there with a the two-pounder gun, there is actually a fellow that's been asking a few questions about that one there. This would have been a formidable uh, tank if it had oh, uh, seen, seen action. Uh, the museum's recently, uh, the museum's assistant manager, Jason Belgrave, has recently just put out a book on uh, the set the cruiser program and it's available through the museum web store and in person and it's an absolutely incredible book so here you guys we had a fellow asking about the um about the lp2 with the two pounder on it these are actually really interesting because we build a lot of these these are australian designed yeah um 
not certainly not British. There was an Australian invention, and because the idea was we were going to take these to North Africa, but um, by the time they got around to building them, the, the North African campaign had sort of progressed. They had to the moved point where on, they were and the two pounder was not a uh, not not worthy, not sufficient. <laughs> so these stayed at home, and they were used by CMF um, for a long time. Uh, I think they only got really got retired in the 50s and 60s. They still played around with them for a little bit after the war, didn't they? Ah, uh, look, I think it was it was pretty well obsolete um, by 1942. Yeah. Uh, still, uh, the gun was still effective against uh, Japanese armour, but yeah. uh, we never actually saw action with these. You can see with some the LP2s. really interesting exhibits here, can't you? Because we've got the the LP there, we've got the Rover. At the back, you can see the Uramba. On the left, you can see the Bofors with the electric. The, the electric, uh, uh, Matilda generator. tank. Down behind Japanese the, uh, 70, 77. Yeah, uh, 77. Yeah, anti-aircraft gun. It looks yeah. like it's been. It looks like it's been recovered from the islands. It actually was that one. Uh, down the back, you can see the AC1, the ETNS1 Scout Car 2. There's the Sherman Firefly, the Caitlin Rose, which unfortunately got damaged earlier on. We've got the Saladin there, and maybe the camera can actually show off the ammunition display because I don't think yeah. anyone really knows much about our ammunition display, and it's pretty impressive. Yes, XA Couple Guy, the uh, Pucker guys are working on their Sentinel tank. We actually supplied them with a few parts that they've utilised to continue that project, so that's really exciting for them. So we do have a Centurion Joff. Um, oh yeah, there you go, guys. So you can see some of the ammo collection, some of the pieces in particular. That black bomb there is a Japanese bomb. And that was actually dropped on Australia, I believe at Darwin, and it was recovered because it didn't detonate. Right. So that's still an original bomb. Which is pretty cool. You can see a Panzer Shrek on the ground. That red casing there you just saw was from a King Tiger. Just the, the, the collection of different munitions we've got here is just awesome. One of my favourite pieces though has to be in the left hand cabinet. The, the American, I think it's a 305mm mortar shell. <laughs> and it's just very impressive to look at. So you can see there it's in the right hand corner. There you go, with all the X's on it. So the interesting thing with those, the Americans built these coastal defense mortars, about 305 millimeters. Um, and they based most of them at a place called Corregidor, um, yep. at the end of the Corregidor Peninsula in the Philippines. So that covered Manila port and defended it. And they installed those after they took it off the Spanish. Um, when the Japanese invaded, they couldn't use the port for a very long time because they still held the fortress at Corregidor. And uh, the U.S. Marines there got so desperate because they were getting bombed day and night by Japanese aircraft that they actually tried to play around with the shells so that they would explode at proximity and use them as anti-aircraft guns. Wow. But the Japanese couldn't even think about sailing a ship in because one of those rounds hits a ship, it's going to go straight top through and it's going to cause significant damage. So, interestingly, that shell, there was a whole shipload of them on their way to Corregidor and uh, the fortress fell. So what happened was the ship diverted to Townsville, unloaded all the shells onto the wharf, and they didn't know what to do with them because there are no other mortars in the, country, in, the, in the world that could use the shells. So they rolled them all into the ocean. <laughs> As they did in those days. As they did. <laughs> Hang the environmental concerns. Oh, look on our screens at the moment. We've got the uh, BMP-1. So that's in, uh, I think, Republican Guard markings yep. for Iraq. 76 mil gun on it. Amphibious. I don't think they use the amphibious capability much in the desert, mm. but uh, quite a formidable uh, armoured personnel carrier, especially mainstay when you, of the Soviet pack. I mean, especially when you end up with the um, the ATGM mounts that the that the Soviets and the, a lot of the, the Warsaw Pact armies mounted on them as well towards the towards the later stages of the Cold War. Yeah, very uh, ingeniously designed vehicle. Oh, absolutely. With, uh, I mean, Firing ports in the side so the uh, yeah. the crew could fire their oh, and AK-47s out. You can see the three uh, or the four the firing ports, ports there. along the um, along and the, the side there. This vehicle was designed to operate in irradiated post-apocalyptic conditions. You know, this yeah. vehicle can transport a squad of men through an irradiated combat zone and take them safely to the other side. Yeah. These vehicles were designed with the Third World War in mind. The, these vehicles were designed for a world where a lot of the the area is just not operable. Contaminated. Yep. So Vic EOS DayZ. So we have a Leopard AS1 and the German version. And also We've got the a great, Leopard. great shot of the Chieftain inside. And um, I know um, Rob's hoping to get this one out and running uh, next year. Yeah, absolutely. They did, a bit of, 
did a bit of work on it this year, but they couldn't quite get it all done in time, which is a shame. But we'll get there. It'll even, I promise, it'll even have the electric kettle inside fixed as uh, British tanks come standard with an electric kettle to make tea. Yes, <laughs> and uh, talking about ammunition displays, I mean, each, uh, each of the vehicles is, uh, is, we've got a box there with uh, the Different ammunition which the, um, You've got Sabo rounds the tank there. would have used. Discarding Sabo rounds here. Again, a, uh, an iconic vehicle of the Cold War. Absolutely. The interesting thing is Chieftains were designed to fight in, um, in Western Europe, and I think they fought in every single continent but Europe, you know, because they saw combat in um, the Middle East extensively. Uh, they saw combat in... Oh, where else have they seen? Mainly the Middle East, actually, now that I think about it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so a lot of Middle Eastern countries bought them as, as mm. well. Iran managed to yes. get some as well yep. before, they, before the fall of the... Look, when sure. I was uh, serving with the British Army back in the 90s, the, the Chieftain was still the mainstay. It was just yeah. being replaced by the, the Challenger, which was coming in. The interesting thing is with the Chieftains, with their engine, because they used a ship engine Yeah. Um, for the Chieftains. I think the Berlin Brigade, or the Berlin Chieftains at one point had, a, had an 80% failure to start rate towards the beginning of their yeah. service, which is pretty dismal. That's right, and on your screen now is the uh, the T-55 medium tank. We were hoping to get this out today, Alex, but um, uh, couldn't get it into, I don't think we could get it into reverse. reverse. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, um, that, that would have been impressive as well. Cam, our resident track. Russian tank driver, who always likes to drive the Russian MBTs, he got in it and uh, couldn't hit it into reverse without a sledgehammer. So he managed to get it in reverse with the sledge, but we determined that that was going to be a bit of a pain on the track, so we took the T-72 back out instead. Yeah, uh, yeah, these uh, these Russian vehicles are not automatic, mm. like the German and British vehicles and American vehicles. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's hard work out there on the track as you're crunching through those through those gear systems. So Leopold the digger, about five minutes left on the stream, so we'll close it up at about 11:30. We're going to get back down to the track and start loading people into vehicles again. We've still got a lot of people here today, don't we? Oh, Up absolutely. And, and uh, boy, we've had, uh, we've had crowds here for the, the past three days. And I must say, the, the weather has been remarkably kind mm. to us. We haven't had the hot days which we've experienced before. Yeah, you can see we're bringing the J back in. Um, if we're bringing the J in, it must mean it's got some light, light issues there with it, which means that we'll bring it in before they get into serious issues, which is a shame. But as is the case with these older vehicles, you know, we... We do have these issues, and we can't run them all day um, without these issues kind of presenting themselves with as much work as we do do, you know, and, and that's just like past, part and parcel of some of these vintage vehicles. But it is a great vehicle, that one. And you can see it's still got the original shirts and with paint on it there on both sides of the turret. And you've got the Thomas sh Shield there, which um, really interesting there. It's, it's actually designed to stop Russian anti-tank rifle rounds because it disintegrates the round as it hits the as it hits the mesh and stops it from actually being able to do any serious damage to the vehicle. Well, very similar to the modern vehicles uh, which we used in Iraq and Afghanistan, having the bar, bar armor, armor on them. Yeah. Yeah, the bar armor was, was designed bombs, to... Uh, it? Yes, it was designed to catch the fins of the RPG-7. Oh, was it? Rockets, and as once the fins were, were pulled off, it basically disarmed the warhead. <laughs> But uh, it made the vehicle, uh, particularly the American vehicles, uh, extra wide. Yes. And look, we've got a good picture of uh, the M36 Jackson with the uh, 90 millimeter tank. This is uh, one of the iconic uh, US tank destroyers of the yeah. Second World War. I do love Janet. Janet is one of my favorites. We might be able to get one of the cameras around the front of Janet as it comes past, and you'll see it. But Janet's a Yugoslavian war veteran, um, we believe, because she's taken what looks to be an RPG round straight through the gun mantlet and you can see the patch cover on it um, if you can manage to get the camera on it and you see a rectangular space there on the gun mantlet you might see it as it comes around there you yep. can sort of see it there at the on the top of the gun mantlet uh, there you go now you can yeah, so the rpg sailed through the mantlet penetrated the hull and it's actually hit the breech of the vehicle and exploded inside which yeah, great was, great picture there uh, yeah. alex vale very ably driving that tank the great thing about our Jackson is because it is a Yugoslavian model, we've got a nice T-55 engine in there, which runs a bit better than the original American engines would, I, I, I'm pretty confident to say. Considering oh. the T-55 engines are a little bit newer, and the, they're actually quite reliable. 
Wonderful shot. Really has, hasn't been that popular today. We've, I think it's only been around the track three times. But People still preferring to go in the more modern, um, heavier main battle tanks. There's Curtis from Ozama on stream. Make oh, sure, guys, yes. if you haven't said hello yet, make sure you do. Give us a wave, Curtis. Give us a wave, Curtis. Give us yeah, a wave. There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> caught. He's been caught. <laughs> So guys, just before the stream ends, any last minute questions? We can maybe do one or two before the stream ends. You can see one of the twins washing down the Pentacle Oh, I J. think we should be selling tickets for people to come and help wash the tanks just down at the, the end tanks. of the day. Exactly. <laughs> How often do you get to wash down a Mark IV Panzer? And there's the second twin. We've got both here, two for the price of one. Yes. <laughs> I must say, the team did a remarkable job yesterday, cleaning cleaning up oh, and putting yeah. everything away. The amount of mud and uh, dust we've got on all these vehicles. Today, it's, uh, I'm not looking forward to the end of the day. Well, that's probably why we're getting a couple of the more, more worn-out vehicles inside earlier on to prevent that kind of backlog at the end. There goes the swim. Oh, I remember this great. girl from yesterday with the blue hair. Yeah, she's been here all weekend. Yep. I think she's done about 10 rides. We do have some really good return customers. They've just come back again and again and again, and they've just had such a good weekend. Yeah, oh, she's having a ball. <laughs> There's Cameron back in his T72. T72 had a very exciting day yesterday. Got driven around by Cam all day yesterday and uh, maybe had a little mishap towards the afternoon. But uh, Cam's back in it again today, and she's just, you put her in the right hands, she'll just go all day. She's the dream boat. So Fryer Duck, we, uh, we don't do rides every weekend. So we do rides for Armour Fest, and then on the regular days, we just have our British 432, and we take people around then. So the, the Panzer IV J, Mark IV, uh, we rebuilt that here using a combination of wrecked vehicle parts, parts from private collections, and uh, some new fabricated parts. So we do that with a lot of our vehicles. Is When we, we manage to get enough components, we'll Frankenstein one together, um, which, although some people criticise as not being a complete original vehicle, um, the vast majority of it is, is original components. And our mentality is instead of having a a floor covered in Panzer parts. We can give you a tangible exhibit to give you a, give you the the visual representation of what these things look like using original components as much as we can. Oh, look at those heavy clouds hanging over the uh, the mountains behind us. Oh, Norm, it's a shame that uh, the stream didn't get yesterday, but we even had the, um, the Ram Kangaroo out from Canada. So that was a nice little vehicle to see out for once. Oh, someone's lost their hat on the track. I don't think they're getting that hat back. <laughs> I think it's going to end up very squished. Not unless we have someone down there who can race out and pick it up before it gets squashed. I don't think that no. might happen, I'm afraid. I might run down there once we finish. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching our Great stream today. Great to see today. you. We hope you had a lovely time. We can't wait to see you next year. Absolutely. Last weekend in August. Last weekend August, every year. Put it in uh, or put it on your bucket list.